Hey folks, it's Ray at DCRainmaker.com, and today I've got your full in-depth review of the new Polar Pacer Pro. Now this is one of two watches announced today, including the base Polar Pacer and the more expensive Polar Pacer Pro. These are priced at $199 and $299 respectively. But before we get into it, it's worthwhile noting it's been 30 years since Polar has used the Polar Pacer branding. In fact, you can go onto eBay and find old Polar Pacer units for like 24 bucks, which is crazy, from, albeit, last century, last millennium, a long, long time ago. Anyways, that aside, this video is about the Polar Pacer Pro. The Polar Pacer, the cheaper unit, isn't coming until next month sometime, so this is what I got right here. Okay, so this review is divided up into a couple big chunks. First off, I've got all the newness. I'm gonna talk about all the new features on this watch compared to other watches. Then from there, I'm gonna give you a quick user interface tour of this watch, showing you how it works for some of the basics like daily activity tracking, as well as sports. After that, I want to talk about some of the testing modes that are in this, as well as just like running with it and things like that, because it is focused on running. That's how Polar is building this as a running watch. And then following that, we'll talk about GPS and heart rate accuracy. And then I've, then I've got some thoughts on like how this all fits in and sort of the future of Polar wearables. That's probably, you probably want to stick around for that. So let's dive into what's new. Now, in this case, I'm comparing it to this watch here, the Polar Vantage M2. And the reason for that is they're both priced at $299. Clearly, I can't compare this to the thing from eBay from 30 years ago. That doesn't really make much sense. Okay, so I've got my notes here with all the newness so I don't forget any of this. Uh, number one, they've added a barometric altimeter so you get more accurate elevation data than the GPS altimeter that you have had in the past on the Vantage M2. Uh, number two, they've added a faster processor and more memory. The memory won't matter to you. The processor, it's funny. I feel like it's faster in some areas and about the same in others. So it's incremental, but it's not like a massive increase across the board. Uh, they've added a new screen, so new MIPS based screen. So there's a lot of rumors that it was an AMOLED screen, so like the fancier Apple Watch or something along those lines. No, it's it's still like a standard issue MIPS based. So if I compare this right here to the M2 and the Grit X on this side and the Pacer Pro in the middle there, uh, you can see it's generally a little bit crispier. The blacks are blacker, which is nice. So over here in the M2, it looks from washed out in the kind of the blackish area. It's hard to see on the camera just because it's just the reality. Uh, and then over here on this one, uh, this is supposed to have the backlight be on, but there you go. Uh, you can see it's just, again, kind of crispier than the V2 or the Polar Grit X was. Okay, and a quick note, if you're finding this video interesting and useful, now is a great time to whack that like button at the bottom there. It really does help out this video and the channel quite a bit. Next, with that bare much like a timber, they've added running power to it. So running power is in the watch itself. There's no accessories required. Very similar to how it works on the Vantage V2 series or the Polar Grit X. And then again, leveraging that bare much like a timber, they've added Hill Splitter. Hill Splitter is Polar's automated like hill repeat counter if you will. It's a little bit different than Garmin's Climb Pro, and that Garmin's Climb Pro is about predicting what's upcoming on a known climb, so a route that you've loaded, versus Polar's is better suited for like weeknight hill repeats. So I'm just a neighborhood hill where you just want to go over and over and over again, and it simply tells you how many repeats you've done and how much elevation you have. Next, they've added route navigation. So in the past, the M2 series, the Polar Vantage M series, did not have route and course navigation or support. Uh, now it does. So you can load in courses automatically from Commute, get turn-by-turn -turn instructions for that. Uh, so that's there as well. Works the exact same way as it does on the high-run watches, uh, just now at a cheaper price point. Following that, there's added Strava Live segment. So if you want to compete against a given live segment on the unit itself, you can do that. Uh, of course, you'll still get the data after the fact in Strava showing up, uh, but now you'll see the segments and the distance until the segment starts, and then once you're in the segment, uh, you'll go ahead and get that data as well. Also added to the Pacer Pro is a slew of different tests. So there's a cycling test, the running test, the walking test, and the general fitness test. In the past, the M2 only had the fitness test, and we'll get to those because I did a bunch of them, uh, and the results were not what I expected. Uh, next, they've changed the strap design uh, so that you can go ahead and use the polar shift straps, which basically means you can use third-party straps with this. Finally, they've also increased just slightly the GPS on battery time from 30 to 35 hours, uh, and they've gone ahead and increased the waterproofing spec from 30 meters to 50 meters. Now, at this point, you might be asking what is missing compared to the Vantage V2 or the Grid X Pro series. The list is right there. It's pretty short and pretty minor, in my opinion. I think Polar has probably cut off the majority of people's reasons to buy those higher-end watches today. I mean, those things, the list right there isn't, like, super impressive. Recovery is certainly the biggest one on the list there, but... You know, a lot of people just don't even look at those metrics anyways. So let's then look at what metrics people are looking at today on the Polar Pacer Pro. Okay, so starting off in the dashboard view here, this is the time, but I can change it to show other dashboard views by pressing this lower right hand button. You can see the activity there. For each of these dashboard views, I can dive into it to see more details. So for example, 18,000 steps today, 
I can scroll on down and see my total active time and calories, and I can press back on this back button right there. There is no touchscreen on this device, so it's all button based. There's three buttons on this side and two buttons on this side. So again, I can iterate through different dashboards so I can see my current heart rate, uh, my last training session, my sleep, these are my sleep stats from last night. So I just tap into that and I can see my uh, kind of detailed stats or my overall stats. So if I go down to my overall stats first, uh, you can see my sleep charge and the sleep time I fell asleep and I woke up. Uh, going down further, you can see the actual sleep time uh, as well as continuity, interruptions, sleep cycles, REM, etc. Moving past sleep, uh, you've got the FitSpark. So what FitSpark does that basically says, hey, here's a workout of the day for you. And it starts off with either a strength or cardio, and then it gives you a supportive workout after you complete those. So in this case, I've already done my run for the day. So it's now saying, hey, you've got 23 minutes of stretching. I can go on down, I can choose that right there and go on down even further. And you'll see some of the stretches that'll give me to go ahead and kind of help things out. Uh, and it does this every single day. And the idea here is to basically give you just a workout of the day to work from. And overall, it's pretty cool. So going on back again, back to the main dashboard page there, you can see it's a little bit slow, a little bit laggy at times. Uh, if I tap again, you see the weather, and back into kind of my total training load for the day. And then on the music page, you can control the music on your phone. There is no music storage on any of the Polar Watch themselves. I mean, technically the older Polar M600 supports it, but you're not gonna, not gonna buy it at this point in time. Uh, so you can see your tracks, you can see the app that you're using on your phone and so on. So with that, let's dive into one of the workouts and how that all works. So to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and hold this right hand button for a second, uh, and this opens up the workout modes. So you can see there, it shows road running. Uh, now at this point, it's trying to engage the optical heart rate sensor. That's the little one that the heart there is well as GPS. Of course, I'm underground, so GPS isn't gonna work too well, uh, but the optical heart rate sensor does turn on. You can see the green light right there. Put my finger over it for a couple seconds. Uh, it lights up all the LEDs, so it senses that and turns them off again. And this is the same sensor as the Ignite, so different than the Advantage series as well as the Grid X. Uh, Polar's gone back to this, which I think is probably a good thing, because I haven't had great luck with those other sensors. Anyways, on this side here, typically speaking, you'll see the heart rate lock in like one to five seconds because you're wearing it on your wrist already. And then GPS has been taking me like 10 to 15 seconds to lock. So not too bad at all. So if I were to press this button right here, it'll go ahead and start that workout. Uh, now I'm basically running along. And it'll show me all the data pages that I've configured for this particular sport profile. Now you saw the road running sport profile earlier. There are many different sport profiles. You can put up to 20 different profiles on this watch at once, but you can choose from like 80 different profiles. And you can customize the data pages, the data fields, all the information you want on those. Uh, so then it just syncs up to your watch and shows you just what you want. So here's a couple photos I took as I was running along so you can see what this looks like. Again, these are all just fields that you can customize later on to show different stats. You'll notice there is the running power there. This is again coming from the wrist itself. No extra stride sensor or anything like that, just based on wrist alone. Once I'm done with the workout, it'll give me a summary page there. I can see all my stats, but I can also see all those up on Polar Flow. Again, on the app or the website, you can see a picture of that right here. And then from there, they get synced off to sites like Training Peaks or Strava or whatever else you have. Now at this point, I wanna talk about some of the performance tests that you can do. And the reason for that is because this watch actually has a new test in it that's not on any other Polar watch to date, which is the new walking test. You may be saying, why would I, I wanna walk? And I said, because that seems like the least painful test to do. And of course, there's the walking test, the running test, a cycling test, and the fitness test. Now, in the case of the cycling test and the running test, those are you go as hard as you can until you die. But the walking test, that doesn't seem like that's gonna hurt as much. I was wrong. I was very, very wrong. So the way the rocking tests work is that you go ahead and you, you start walking. Um, so actually you start the test to basically warm up for like five or so minutes and it walks you through that, no pun intended. And then it says, kick it up. And so you, you start walking faster and it wants you to walk really, really fast, but not to run. And I know this because it's constantly yelling at you not to run. No matter how fast I walk, it thought I was running the entire time. But the other kicker is that you have to get above a certain heart rate, which it turns out is reasonably challenging, by the way. So it wanted me to be above 120 beats per minute, but not to do it while running. So I had to walk as fast as I could. My most ridiculous power walk that I could imagine, I power walked it until the test completed, at which point it gave me a VO2 max score of 48, which is not my VO2 max score. I've been both tested like in a fancy lab, but also I've got a gazillion watches that keep pretty good track of what my VO2 max scores across the board. And I roughly know that it should be between about 56 to 61, give or take. And what's notable is that when you finish a running workout, it gives you the running index. And Polar's own site says that running index is the VO2 max estimate. So in this case, in the day before, it was like 57 or so from a run I did. So I know that like it's already off by a boatload to begin with. But nonetheless, I went out today and I suffered through the run test. The run test is essentially the same kind of rough structure. You start off, you do a warm up for 10 minutes, 
so it starts off nice and slow with a walk, life is grand, and then from there you build up into like a trot, and then a nice run pace, and then a tempo pace, and then eventually to as hard as you can go until you can't run anymore, and you can't maintain the pace that it's asking you to do. And at the end of that, I got 56. So quite a bit of difference between that and the lower end walking test. Anyways, let's move on to something else that's tested, which is the accuracy. In this case, both the heart rate and the GPS. So starting off on the heart rate side here, you can see for this first workout I did an inner workout was actually pretty good. Very good alignment. These are 800 meter repeats. Uh, a couple of second bobbles here and there, but nothing major it was pretty much on par with the chest straps. So that was good. And you see this more steady state workout here, also pretty good alignment. A few minor bobbles here and there, but no big deal. And the same goes for this indoor Peloton ride, pretty much spot on. And then finally my outdoor running test from today, also pretty much spot on as well for 40 minutes, including at peak output. So good there. Now, what about GPS? Well, that's that's a little bit kind of messier. It's not bad, it's just not like great. So starting off here, you can see when I'm out like in the middle of the country, like farmland, it's perfectly fine. It's the same as most other watches at this price point today, which is good. But as I got closer to like trees and especially tunnels and bridges, it didn't, it wasn't good at all. And it wasn't like bad, it just wasn't good. It was just kind of like, mm. I guess it's fine. And the more I was in the trees, the more it just kind of meandered a bit, which I think if it was a year or two ago, that might have been acceptable, but I think the bar is gonna get raised over the course of 2022, and I worry that a watch like this using the same GPS chipset as all these other watches right here might not cut the mustard anymore by the end of the year. So again, this isn't bad GPS, it's just not like, something to write home about kind of GPS. So with that, where do we stand on this watch? And in some ways, it's important to look at this watch in the context of these other two watches. So if you look at the Polar Vantage M2 on this left-hand side here, uh, this watch is way better than that watch. Like this watch has no purpose in life anymore. And I even asked Polar that, I'm like, why would someone buy this watch? And they didn't, they didn't answer my question. Um, so I asked it again, they also didn't answer my question again. Uh, and they don't have a good answer for that. So there's no good reason to buy that watch. There's absolutely no features whatsoever. They did confirm this, that the Polar Vantage M2 has that the Pacer Pro doesn't have. So this, this one's dead. So then you look at something like the Vantage V2 or the Grid X Pro, uh, which are higher end watches that cost a couple hundred bucks more. In that case, there's a list I talked about earlier for reason to buy those, but the list is, is kind of tough. So then you're left with this. And by itself, this is a very good deal in the Polar lineup. After all, it just got all these features and it's easily the most full featured watch that Polar has ever made at the sub $300 price point. The thing that kind of like makes me conflicted is that it's billed as a running watch. That's the pace of branding is from the running side, their entire marketing campaign is the running side. But compared to other running watches in the market today at this price point, including the Garmin 400 245 and the Coros Pace 2 at 199, this is not a great competitor to those. Those watches are either far cheaper or have more features in this. So this is a, a tough pickle. But if you shift the perspective of the lens from running watch to multi-sport triathlon watch, this looks incredibly compelling. If that's $300 price point, there's like nothing else that kind of competes in that range with all the things that this has here, especially around structure workouts. Again, Koros has that, but Polar does that better. Polar does a lot of the physio stuff better in terms of training load. That's on here, that is not. It's technically again on Chorus, but it's just not as good. And ultimately, I think this is more about branding than technology. This is not a great running watch. It is an okay running watch, but it is a great multi-sport and triathlon watch for this particular price point. And I'm not really sure how you resolve that. That's like Polar's problem, not really my problem. I just review technology products. Hopefully you found this interesting or useful. If so, go ahead and like that like button at the bottom there or hit subscribe for plenty more sports technology goodness. Have a good one.